Welcome to SAI at Home, Stay Connected. We're trying to stay connected with all of our supporters um, and um, friends. And uh, today in conversation with uh, Salima Hashmi. And uh, so, hello Salima. Um, it's so nice to connect with you in these difficult times, but like you said, uh, you know, the marvels of technology. Um, uh, so, um, I don't think you need any introduction, but uh, I'm just going to uh, say a few words because you just have so many uh, achievements and I'm sure I'm going to miss a few. So, uh, but uh, you're an art educator, foremost, I think, and that's why I put that first. Um, an artist yourself. And uh, I have to say, I have to mention your mentorship because I think that's something that in the artist world you're known for. And then of course, um, the fact that you're a writer and a curator and a gallery owner. And, um, and then um, having done, uh, you know, doing all of that, you're also uh, a women's rights activist. And um, you've taught at the National College of Art and uh, our premier institution in Pakistan for, for art. And you've been the principal of that college. Um, you're the founder of the uh, Beacon House University in Lahore. Um, and the he, dean. He, no, for, one, of the, one of the founders, not the founder, one of the founders. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> um, and currently the dean. Uh, no, I've uh, retired as the dean. Okay. Um, but I'm still involved with something which is called uh, the UNESCO Maranjit Institute of South Asian Arts, which is located there. It's a scholarship program for South Asian students. I'm the director of that, but I stepped down from the, the deanship. Rashid Rana uh, is the dean now of the School of Visual Arts and Design at PNU. Okay. So, um, uh, one of the things that I wanted to talk with you about today um, is about some of the women artists that we, uh, in, in Pakistan. And uh, I think we all know that uh, when we talk about modern artists, uh, you know, uh, modern art in uh, Europe, America, and, and in South Asia, that uh, women artists were a rarity. And that all changed with the contemporary art scene. And I, I believe you played a major role in that change and uh, in, in Pakistan. And so I want you to talk a little bit about uh, your work in that area and then how uh, the women artists have changed or shaped the contemporary art scene in Pakistan. Well, I think the women artists were, were there from the word go in terms of um, uh, 1947, they were already, uh, the fine arts department in the Punjab University was already headed by a woman, was Anna Molka Ahmed, who was uh, <clears throat> of uh, Persian British descent, uh, uh, Polish British descent, but married to what was then a Pakistani artist. Um, but you, certainly women were the educators. So while the big names in art, um, when I was growing up and I was a student, were people who were very well known. They were the Lahore Art Circle, um, you know, and then of course there were the, the old masters like Chukpari and so on. But it was really women who were the mainstay of running the institutions. They were the teachers. They were not these bohemian big stars, um, but they were the spine, if you like. And um, so I was taught uh, by some of these eminent educators. Um, and later on, when I came you know, back from England, having done my degree and joined the National College of Arts to teach, um, I was actually only one of, there were only two or three women teachers at the time. They were all men, but that began to change and it specifically needed to be highlighted when in the 80s, uh, after General Ziaul Haq took over, and women artists found that some women and the minorities especially were being targeted. So they somehow took the lead, um, both 
in the fact that they, their work made comment on the change that was happening. And also they refused to compromise because there was a state diktat about the kind of work that was preferable in those years. Obviously things like calligraphy or non figurative work. Mm -hmm. um, and I was a young teacher and um, several of us artists got together and, uh, and th this was the occasion of um, the national exhibition. And we drafted what we, which came to be known as the Manifesto of the Women Artists of Pakistan. It's now become a very well-known document. At the time, it was a secret document. What it did do was to galvanize women artists because we decided that we needed to mold our work in response to what was the need of the day. Uh, it was a very savage time politically and socially. And therefore, we found that while the political parties collapsed and caved in, it was the women's movement which really took charge. And not just um, women artists. There were the women poets, there were the women writers, there were women activists, there were women lawyers. These were all women in the forefront of this movement. Um, it was in fact the only political movement of the time. Um, and somehow that was the time which transformed the practice of a lot of women artists. It helped that many of them were teachers. So you were in an influential position to talk about what was happening around you with your students, men and women. And I think that it's really from 77 onwards that we find that the contemporary art movement in Pakistan becomes galvanized um, to the point that it brings up fresh ideas, it gives impetus and energy to practitioners who did not get any state support, but they bonded together. So that was really the story of the commencement of um, an acknowledgement of women in the arts, though they had been there in the background all along, um, but they were not the stars, if you like. I mean, there were people like Zubeda Aga, of course, and Anna Morka Ahmed, um, but they, you know, they were sort of a counterpart, but a more muted counterpart, if you like. Women found their voice in the most difficult of times, and that was the 80s. Um, and that led me to document what I saw was happening. And that's eventually, um, it ended up in a book uh, in the year 2000, uh, a book on the, about the women artists of Pakistan and their story. Right, right. Well, thank you so much for leading us through that. Uh, I'm sure it must have been a challenging time for, uh, for some of the women artists. And you've been active, actually, very active um, in the battle for women's rights, not, not just uh, uh, you know, among artists. And you continue to speak out about uh, the rights of women uh, in Pakistan. What motivates you? Um, it's not just women. Um, mind you, the Women's Action Forum, which was founded during the years of their years, I was one of the founding members. Um, but later on, when the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan came into being also in the 80s, um, I was a member of that and I continue to be a member of that. I'm on the council and currently representing Punjab on the council. So, I mean, we don't see women's rights as being separate from human rights. So, of course, women and children are among the most downtrodden um, of the populace and therefore uh, they deserve special attention. But so do all the other uh, sectors uh, whose human rights are being violated all the time, which includes the minorities, which includes labor, which includes minors, which includes transgender. I mean, you know, it's across the board. So yes, um, what motivates me, I suppose it's partly in my genes, um, being the daughter <laughs> of two activists. Um, a poet and a journalist. Um, I think that this is something I grew up with. Um, my father went to jail, you know, when I was eight years old. And 
uh, I saw what belief, um, what you have to give up for your beliefs. Uh, I also learned the value of things which I suppose are very basic to human life. I learned about courage, uh, about loyalty, about friendship, um, and also that um, you are really not alone. Uh, even though the struggle is sometimes very lonely, um, but because you're speaking for a large number of people, you do feel their support. They do, you know, they're there with you. Um, my mother was um, one of, she worked for the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. She worked for UNICEF. Uh, she was one of the first women journalists in Pakistan. Um, my father was a very known poet, Fez. Affairs and affairs. So, I mean, he came with his own, um, his own band of, of belief, courage, and his vision. And um, that is something because it's a part of how you look at the world and also as part of how you envisage the future, um, that it, um, it, it comes with ease. Um, it's not you can't act, it, act on it with ease. There are a lot of problems, um, a lot of decisions which are very difficult at times. Um, but I think that there's a great brotherhood, sisterhood of people who are with you um, in the arena of uh, human rights, of things like freedom of expression, which of course includes the arts. Right, right, yeah. So, um, besides your uh, professional work, um, yeah, you're also promoting artists by showing their work in your gallery and curating international exhibitions. Um, what prompted you? This is kind of unusual for someone uh, like you to uh, have a gallery. What prompted you to set up Rotas? It was really, again, interestingly, it was the Zia years in which there was interesting work happening, but there was no way of exhibiting it. And uh, the government galleries wouldn't go near it and they had very, you know, a lot of restrictions. Um, so this was, you know, a friend who were architects uh, in Bindi in Islamabad, and they had a space in the front of their architecture office and they were interested in this and you know, let's start a gallery and we jumped at the idea because it gave us, um, the space and the ease that an already running office afforded. Um, also, we didn't have to pay the rent. Yeah, and um, so that is where uh, we started. Uh, we gave it the name, the Rotas Gallery, and uh, named Basha, the architect. In fact, he's the architect of the, the National Gallery in Islamabad. Um, you know, he was uh, very generous with his time and uh, the attention that he focused on it. So we were able to show work that deserved a showing in those very dark times. For me as a teacher, of course, it was important that I could see new art and new talent which was emerging. And this gave a space and a chance for it to be seen and for those people to gain confidence in very difficult times. Uh, we went around, we went to Karachi, we, I knew the Lahore scene, uh, we looked at Quetta, we looked at places where it was possible to find those people who were doing work which would be unwelcome in official circles. That's how it started and um, that was 1981 and we kept going um, and then uh, it moved moved um, venue several times. When they moved their office, it moved with them. And then when I retired from NCA, you know, after I finished as principal and so on, um, I got a bunch of money. So I thought, okay, so let me do something in my own house in Lahore. And I altered, made alterations. And the, the, it was to be my studio. Um, pulled down the garage and made a space. And my friends who were really my enemies, they said, how can you be so selfish and make a studio for yourself? You know, you should be doing something for other people. So that became Rotas too. Right, right. And um, so really it was accidental and um, 
um, but and yet it was not accidental. There was a need, um, and therefore um, that's how it happened for me. In all these years, it's really been an extension of my teaching because right. um, I feel that creating audiences is as essential as providing space for, for talent. And it allowed me to do both. Um, I, you know, I could be Diostani uh, in that space. Uh, I have to confess um, that I did not, um, I did not cater to big names. I didn't cater to fashionable trends. Um, my focus always was to try and push the boundaries so that those who come to look at work, they should also feel that they have to change their view of how to, how to experience um, art and should be participants in unusual encounters. Now, I have to admit, you, you have always uh, had some very talented young folks, uh, uh, you know, works from some very talented young folks at, uh, at Roitas. Um, besides your, um, uh, you know, besides your being very busy professionally, I know you have a very busy family life as well. And whenever we visited you, you're, you're always surrounded by your family members. And I want to know how, uh, how you're dealing with this, the social distancing that we all are required now during the pandemic. Well, it's very distant. We haven't had anybody visit for the last two months, which is most unusual. Um, luckily, because it's a bungalow type house, uh, there is space for all the various family members who live here, which is, you know, my son and daughter with their children, you know, their spouse and their children. Um, so uh, we meet when we want to meet and we, are, um, we don't when we don't. But yes, um, the family has been part of uh, uh, this, this space, which is a family space. And it's also a space where people come and go from, all parts of the world, uh, artists come and go, writers come and go, um, people who are activists, people who are looking for answers to their research. In all these years, you know, there's um, obviously when you've been teaching for 35, 40 years, you build up a big archive, a visual archive. So that is there, you know, in the gallery and if people want to consult or want to discuss the work of uh, uh, people who are no longer artists who are no, no longer with us, uh, one can help them. There's uh, images on offer. Um, we can try to, you know, to do what one can. So in that sense, the family really dovetails into everything else. Uh, my daughter teaches film studies. My son teaches psychology. Um, so they are, um, they're not too distant from um, what I do. And because they're both teachers, so they understand that, you know, students will come and go. Their own students come and go in the house. So it's a little bit like a beehive, if you like. And it's an open house um, with this, um, you know, Sometimes we even have um, runaway couples who land up here. Uh, there have been more than one marriage ceremony which has taken place in this house. Uh, you know, when mothers and fathers are uh, not intelligent enough to agree to what their children want, you know, we say, we lend a hand and say, okay, you want to get married? The living room is open this evening, you can come and get married. So that has also has happened in this house. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about your work. Um, you know, we've, we've all seen the work of the artists that you've promoted and uh, uh, you're, an, you're an artist and uh, we don't get to see a lot of your work. So tell, tell us a little bit about your work. Do you have a favorite work that you created? Um, well, um, my work has changed obviously, over the years. I have not been 
in the last decade or so, I will say, I have been less active as a practitioner because writing took over. Uh, and the writing came as an accompaniment to the gallery and also to my work as a curator. I found in the years um, when, you know, in the last 20 years or so, there lots of very interesting exhibitions took place, but there was not enough writing going on. And so the exhibition would happen and it would disappear without a trace. And that, that I really felt um, sad about. So really almost um, as a result of trying to fill that gap, I took up writing and um, my writing, my, you know, the book, the first book I did, of course, was when we were artists of Pakistan and I've done subsequent work also. Uh, it did mean that you know, writing, you know, took the front seat and my own work retreated. So I would say it's really the last 10 years or so that I have not been much of a practitioner. I do try and keep my hand in over the summer. I'd like to do some drawing just so I don't get totally rusty. My work from the early years in which I was very interested in um, looking at certain kinds of mediums, um, which included the old master techniques of glazes, um, moving on to things like mixed media and collage. And then uh, when I went to the US, um, you know, 20 years ago, I got very interested in egg tempera. I got very interested in um, working with charcoal and with pure pigment. Um, I have worked mainly on paper. Um, and that is really, when I started reading about the history of, um, of colonialism uh, and its effect on art making um, in the subcontinent, I realized that, okay, you know, my, my first love then became, you know, paper-based, water-based mediums. Um, and that continued, especially during the Zia period when my work became smaller for convenience. So if there was a police raid, you could put it under your arm and make a run for it. Um, and it did happen once or twice. I mean, it was not my work, but it was a work of Anwar Saeed's, which we had put up in an exhibition. And in the morning, a review appeared which mentioned that the work was anti-establishment. So we dashed to the gallery and we quickly took down those three works and put up some landscapes just as the plain clothes men came in. And they sort of looked around and they said, oh, um, there was something else in the paper about this exhibition. We read something. I said, never believe what you read in the paper. And, oh, they're all just making it up. Anyway, so um, my work has been partly political in its comments. It has, during those years, in the Zia years, it had a lot to do with the female body and the fact that the body became um, a space for uh, dissent, where the state's new laws claimed ownership of the female body. So my reaction was, you know, what any bloody-minded artist would do, I bared the body, um, and so on. And then later it was, I'm an anti-nuclear activist, so I did a series of works after Pakistan and India both tested their nuclear device, which left me totally aghast at the stupidity of such a thing. Um, so I did a series of works on that. I've done works based on domestic violence because there were one or two cases which just shook me um, to the core, uh, reading about um, what could happen to women. Um, the, the earthquake that took place, and I think that is one of the works that you have in your collection, um, that was something that was numbing absolutely in the, uh, um, in the devastation that nature can bring about and how it alters um, our lives. I suppose it's something to do with what's happening to us right now too. Um, so those were works that I did um, which really came out of very deep anguish. Um, there have been works that have come out of the joy of um, 
the joy and the sensualness of uh, the touch. Uh, also, when I was in America, I was terribly homesick. And um, so there were a series of landscapes that I did. I never did landscapes, but I called them inner landscapes. And they were to do with the way I imagined the Punjab, you know, the, the spaces. Um, I didn't think I would react that way, but I did. So over the years, there have been different um, reactions. Um, I have, in the last two or three years, been doing these very small, tiny works, which are, um, which are little soliloquies every year when I've gone away. Uh, so they're little drawings which are soliloquies. Um, to say which are my favorite works, you know, it alters. Where I'm sitting, um, you see behind me, there's a very, large sort of painting. You can only see portion of it. Now you can probably see it. Right. <laughs> it's a student work. It's my, uh, it's a work that I did as a student and it's one of my favorites and it stayed with me. Um, many times some people have offered to buy it, but um, it's something that made me, um, made me mature as a student. And therefore it's, it, it's a reminder to me um, of that experience. So I think that um, the discussion about one's work um, can be on a formal level, but for me, it's always to do with uh, the intimacy of experience, really. That's uh, very, very nice of you to share with us some of these very personal uh, thoughts and, uh, and, and that work of yours. Uh, you know, I've been in this room uh, where you're sitting, and uh, I've never really known about that work. So thank you for sharing that. And uh, thank you for being so generous uh, with your time. I'm sure, uh, just like all of us, you too are working from home because the work never stops. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, as I said, we're going to share some of these, uh, some of our conversations with our uh, friends and our supporters here and uh, I want to, to you know you always have an open invitation we're looking forward to seeing you in person at the Institute in the near future that will depend on something known as COVID-19 and uh, whether air travel resumes yes and, um, the world is going to be quite a different place um, and so one can, one, can, one can conjecture all kinds of scenarios. I think that currently uh, artists and writers and poets, uh, people who have what Tarekali calls a third eye in the center of the forehead, uh, so they, can, they look above um, the heads of others to try and figure out um, what is it that we see in the future. One only hopes that we don't go back to the frenzied world uh, that we knew, which was um, um, trying to kill off and consume as much as possible. Uh, instead that we have, we take pause. Um, this was a pause that we didn't ask for. It was foisted on us, but now that it's with us, one hopes that the pause um, is fertile and it's fertile so that people who, on whose shoulders the responsibility rests to, um, to create a vision of another world, that they take this responsibility seriously um, because the world that we stopped or the virus stopped now that we look at it, it's not a pretty world. It has revealed to us our terrible weaknesses. Right. And we have got in, in good conscience in a world of such plenty and such riches, we have no business to be living in societies which are racked with such basic inadequacies. Um, and I hope that, um, that those to whom um, there is a talent given 
both to dream and to uh, make work and to film and to make music, which insists that we are not happy with the world that we have. We want a better one. So I suppose that is what one has to do uh, in this very long pause. And I think it will be a longer pause than we, we realize. Um, it's going to be with us for a while, even though it doesn't seem apparent, but it is going to be there. No, I agree with you. I think um, it's given us an opportunity to think uh, about how we live our lives. And uh, I couldn't agree with you more. I think uh, we, needed, we needed to do that. We needed to change the way we were, the way we were headed. Um, thank you again, uh, Salima. Um, this has been really a pleasure. And uh, like I said, we hope that it won't be too long before we have you here in person. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for talking to me. <laughs>